Here we are back to work on more notes on the cell. Section 7-2 is going to be divided into two parts to make it easier for you to take the notes. We're talking about the structure of the eukaryotic cell. If you remember from the previous section, a eukaryotic cell is a cell that contains a nucleus. So we're going to learn about the parts and pieces to the cell and what the function of the parts and pieces are. Along the way, I'll be doing some comparison, so you may want to jot those down within your notes so it will make it easier for you to do some of the upcoming work. Comparing the cell to a factory. Organelles are little organs which carry out specialized functions within a cell. So if you think about the cell as a miniature human being or miniature multicellular big organism, each of their little organelles compares to something that's in our body. A eukaryotic cell is divided into two parts. There's the nucleus, which is located in the center of the cell, and then there's the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm is kind of a gel-like structure where all of the rest of the organelles um, are located. So the cytoplasm is the portion of the cell outside of the nucleus. So when you're looking at the cell, you've got your cell, and then inside is the nucleus, and this part here is going to be the cytoplasm. I guess I could do that like that. That's going to be the cytoplasm. And on your coloring sheet, you colored the cytoplasm yellow. It's what's called a colloidal suspension, um, kind of a very clear, thick fluid. It's kind of on the consistency of snot. So if you think about what snot is like in your nose when you have a cold or something, that thick fluid, that's kind of what cytoplasm is like. It's in motion and appears to be streaming, so you might hear the term cytoplasmic streaming. Everything is always moving around, uh, similar to the way that your blood kind of moves throughout your body. The cytoplasm moves also, but it's not blood. It contains all of the rest of the organelles and stores nutrients. So let's divide these two parts to the cell and look at them a little more closely. We're going to start with the nucleus. Sometimes the nucleus is called the main office. So if we're comparing it to a factory, the main office is what controls everything. Think about it as the main office in the school building. Or sometimes I refer to the nucleus as the brain of the cell. Because without the nucleus, things aren't going to occur within the cell. So once again, the nucleus is the control center of the cell. And it kind of resembles a golf ball, if you think about what a golf ball looks like, because it has all of these tiny little pores for things to pass through from the center of the nucleus out to the cytoplasm. It contains all of the cell's DNA, and if you remember from previous things, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's the genetic material, um, so that's where all the hereditary portion of your cell is controlled. The nuclear envelope, sometimes called the nuclear membrane, surrounds the nucleus. So once again, the nuclear envelope is sometimes called the nuclear membrane. You'll see it written either way. It contains pores, which allow materials to move into and out of the nucleus. I referred to that in the previous slide. And what it's moving are messages or instructions through those pores. Basically, it's moving instructions from the DNA out to the cell for protein synthesis to occur. And we'll talk about that in a future chapter in the book. Also what's contained in the nucleus is what's called chromatin. Chromatin is a granular material in the nucleus consisting of DNA bound to protein. Also, chromatin are those stringy spaghetti-like things that you colored purple within your cell. Chromatin, also you will hear, hear the word chromosome. Those are 
a different form of chromatin. So these two are synonymous. Chromosomes and chromatin are both in the nucleus and they carry hereditary material. And there is a nice picture that shows you all of the parts and pieces to the nucleus. The nuclear envelope surrounds the outside. The chromatin are those purple spaghetti-like strands that are on here. The nucleolus, that which we'll talk about in the next slide, is, a, is, a, is in the center of the nucleus. And then you can see the nuclear pores where things are going to pass out into the cytoplasm. And there's chromosomes, wouldn't you know it. This, that's condensed chromatin, and those are thread-like structures that contain genetic information. And we have the nucleolus. Notice the spelling on here, so you don't get those two mixed up. Nucleolus, spelled a little bit differently, differently than nucleus. It's inside the nucleus and is where the assembly of ribosomes begin. So this would be the function, assembly of ribosomes, of the nucleolus. Ribosomes are small particles of RNA and protein found in the cytoplasm. So ribosomes are where protein synthesis takes place. Protein synthesis means the constructing of a protein molecule, which we're going to talk about later. But you need to know that the function of the ribosomes is where protein synthesis is going to take place. Once again, proteins are assembled on the ribosomes. And those were all those tiny little red dots that I made you color on that cell coloring sheet. They are scattered in the cytoplasm or they're on the endoplasmic reticulum. And we abbreviate endoplasmic reticulum ER. So once again, they're scattered in the cytoplasm or they're on the endoplasmic reticulum. So each ribosome is like a small machine that makes protein on orders that come from its boss, the nucleus. So the nucleus sends stuff out into the cytoplasm to the DNA, to the ribosomes, and tells the ribosomes what kind of proteins to make. The endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum, and I would prefer that you just abbreviate it by using ER. It's an internal membrane brain system or a subway system throughout the cell. So it gives things an opportunity to transport, think about the subway, the underground subway in New York City, how things can move through from point A to point B. Lipid components are assembled and then exported from the cell. And remember, lipid are fats. Exported means to leave. Kind of remember some of those vocabulary words. There are two types of endoplasmic reticulum. There's the rough, rough, oops, I'll go back. The rough endoplasmic reticulum. Rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes attached on its surface, so that means it's bumpy. Bump. B-U-M-P, bump. Is that right? I'm not a good speller. So it's bumpy, as you can see. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum contains enzymes that help synthesize. Once again, synthesize means to make lipids, which are fats, and detoxify drugs. There are no ribosomes on smooth ER. Now, where would you think that you would find a smooth, a lot of smooth ER in your particular body? Well, here's the key. Detoxify drugs 
the liver. Liver cells contain a very large amount of smooth ER because that's the job of your liver is to detoxify your body of bad things. So there's going to be a lot of smooth ER in your liver cells. All right, onward we go. The Golgi apparatus. Golgi is capitalized because it's named after the person who found this particular structure. So Golgi is always written with a capital G. The Golgi apparatus receives proteins produced in the rough ER. And remember, the rough ER has ribosomes on the surface, and ribosomes make protein. The Golgi apparatus looks like flattened sacks piled on one another. So sometimes you'll see it drawn like that. You colored it brown on your coloring sheet. Colored it brown. It was on the very top of that coloring sheet. So that's what the Golgi apparatus looks like. What's its function? It is a protein packaging factory. It modifies, sorts, and packages proteins for storage and secretion outside of the cell. It wraps protein molecules to, e to be exported from the cell surface like hair, skin, and tears because all of these are made of proteins. So basically, it puts the finishing touches on the proteins before they are ready to leave the factory. So if you think about the Golgi apparatus as a place where everything is ready to be packaged and then ready to be shipped out, that's what the function of the Golgi apparatus is. So once again, proteins are shipped from the Golgi apparatus to wherever they need to go, which might be, once again, your tears, your skin, your hair, or wherever else your body is in need of these particular macromolecules. Lysosomes. Lysosomes are the cleanup crew, or they act like the cleanup crew. And if you were to look at a picture of a lysosome, it's basically just a circle. Nothing fancy in your cell. So what does that mean by a cleanup crew? Well, lysosomes are small organelles filled with enzymes. And enzymes are proteins that break down or digest large molecules. So these are sometimes known as the cleanup crew. They get rid of all the waste and the junk that is going to accumulate in your cell. So that's why, once again, the lysosomes are called the cleanup crew. And I think of them as little Pac-Men going around and chomping up all of the junk that is not wanted in your particular cell. And here's a good example. You bruise yourself. Lysosomes come in and they digest those dead red blood cells and the white blood cells make new. Now if you think about when you bruise yourself, you hit yourself and the bruise is kind of a purplish, blackish, reddish, and then over time it changes to a yellowish, greenish color. That's because these lysosomes are going in and eating up all of the, they're disposing of all of those dead red blood cells and as those are disappearing under the surface of your skin that's why it's changing color. Eventually the lysosomes will get rid of all of the dead red blood cells while the white blood cells make new ones and your bruise goes away. So that's how you get rid of a bruise. The lysosomes are the ones that come in and eat all of that dead blood because when you bump yourself you're bursting a blood vessel the blood rushes out and then it dies
And here would be an example. Lysosomes are also in single-celled animals, and they also clean up and digest a lot of the waste in single-celled animals. We're going to conclude this particular podcast with vacuoles. Vacuoles are sac-like structures that store materials such as water, salts, proteins, and carbs. And one thing that you have to remember about a vacuole is they're extremely small in an animal cell and they're very large in a plant cell. So in plant cells, there's a large single central vacuole filled with liquid. And if you remember from your coloring sheet, in the middle of that coloring sheet for the plant, you color that big blue structure. That would have been the vacuole. In your animal cell, it were, they were very small things. Contractile vacuoles are found in single-celled organisms and their job is to pump excess water out of the cell. So both plant and animal cells have vacuoles. The difference is their size and their function. This concludes the first half of 7-2 notes.